Um, I'm hoping that I'm visible to you. I can see myself. And, uh, and I have to tell you, for me, um, it's, I'm probably last amongst all the people who talked and are probably in the audience about using uh, audiovisual equipment. Uh, but I think that what's what's um, very very interesting to me, and I and I'm, I'm glad that you invited me to hear the rest of the talks, is how much they really resonated with me. I really do think that um, the things that I've learned today are very very useful things, and I really would like to um, tell you my life story, sort of how I got to where I am, because it's very different. And one of the things I think that I'd like to tell you um, first is. Um, the older I get, and as far as I can tell, I'm the oldest panelist here, here, the older I get, the more reluctant I am to give people advice because life takes twists and turns that are very individual for people. Uh, and I think that some of the things that you really believe um, are most important when you're youngest turn out to be a little bit off to one side. I think that uh, James's story just before mine is really a very good and actually fairly typical example is that you can start in one place and you can end up in a similar but in some ways very different place. I also thought that Anand's story was great. All of the characteristics that really make one succeed are characteristics that you learn from people who are important to you. Uh, that's how you get to see so far. You get to stand on the shoulders of the people who have been before you. And I thought Nita's talk was really very inspiring too. Um, and no matter what anyone says, it's harder to be a, f a female CEO. Uh, we live in a world that if it's moving, hopefully it'll be in the right direction. Women really do have a more difficult time. Uh, society hasn't really fully adjusted to treating them as equals and anything that you can do to advantage yourself, it's fair, you should do that. So really, I will um, start at the beginning. Again, I'm not a tech person. Um, I've, I've, you know, that's just never been part of what I've done. In fact, when I was in college, I was an English major. I went to a college in Massachusetts called Amherst College, which is a small liberal arts school. And, um, and I'm guessing that uh, there are very few people in, in the audience who would actually even consider something like that. Although I will tell you that the skills that I learned there to be a good writer, to be a good communicator, have been skills which have been very, very useful to me throughout my entire life. And one of the things that I think is really um, very important, and it really does go through all of entrepreneurship activity, is you really do have to be a good communicator. You have to figure out what your audience um, needs to know. Audiences are not the same as one another. You have to really consider different audiences. And then I think you really, at that point, have to figure out how to be, how to make yourself persuasive. And so part of the reason I tell you that is if I'm going to, um, give you really one piece of advice and maybe it's the only one that I'm going to give you is that narrowing yourself into a place that doesn't allow flexibility is probably going to be impairing and so thinking there's sort of one way to get things done um, is not really the way to most adequately solve all of the problems that you have to face as you go forward and a lot and, the, and sort of the second part of that is life really has many twists and turns you aren't certain, and I'm going to give you some examples from my own life of where it's going. And I think that as you, you know, really can just sort of be chill about that and understand that the basic skills you have to solve problems, they stay with you. You really can solve the problems that you have as you go forward. So I was an English major, and like English majors uh, probably then as now, that doesn't really lead to obvious employment uh, opportunities. And so at the time I was in Massachusetts, I graduated from college and uh, didn't know what I was going to do at that point in time with people who were with an education often thought about if they really didn't know what to the, they were going to do something like law school because there was no um, prerequisites that really made you get into law school. So I went out um, to San Francisco from Massachusetts with my girlfriend, who's now my wife for many years, and I began working in a law firm as a paralegal. And what I quickly learned was that law was not for me. And just I'll tell you a sort of a small story about that. The, the way they gave out law, work in the law firm was that on Monday morning they gave you your assignment for the whole week and then you 
handed in Friday afternoon and Monday they gave you next Monday the assignment for the whole week but just by sort of working at my normal pace and I, I could really get all that work done by Wednesday so what would I do with myself well you know this is in the days before uh, video games or uh, you know the even probably I guess even the internet and iPhones all that stuff and so uh, you know I, I, I had time on my hands so I could read a book or do whatever I was interested in but one of the things, and this I think is in common with everyone in the audience, I was good in math. I really had enjoyed math. I was very good at it. And so, again, my girlfriend bought me a book called Playing Blackjack as a Business. And so in the course of that summer, I actually learned how to be a um, really a flawless card counter in blackjack. And the interesting part of that story is that on the way back from California back to the East Coast, uh, we stopped in Lake Tahoe. I played blackjack for three days. I made $1,200, which to me was a fortune at the time. It paid for the whole trip. But the more important part of the story is that now I had a good story for when I went back to get a job. I wasn't going to be just, you know, sort of your average liberal arts major who graduated from college. And I actually then um, began to apply for jobs on Wall Street. And, and I did get a job actually fairly quickly. This was, and this story was really a big part of it. I was a good student, but this really sort of set me apart. And I actually um, found the work that I was doing on Wall Street, mathematical stuff about it, the quantitative portion of it, to be very um, much to my liking. It was, it was like going to the racetrack with a suit on. And it was very, um, just to be blunt about it, lucrative. So, you know, even though sort of money wasn't the biggest object, it was something that really came along um, for that, you know, with that job. What was interesting about it was that um, shortly, you know, after working on Wall Street, maybe, I guess, two and a half years into it, three other fellows and myself started our own firm, which is actually still in business as a Wall Street firm. But when I was about 25 or 26 years old, um, it really seemed to me, although this was fun, it wasn't really what I wanted to do with my whole life. The main object of working on Wall Street is to, um, frankly, to retire early, to make as much money as you can to retire early. And that wasn't just how I looked in my own value system about, the, about where I wanted my life's you know, progress to go. Now, still my girlfriend, um, uh, same person, was actually in medical school at that point in time and again just to be blunt about it I had a nice much nicer apartment than most people who went to medical school from my earnings on Wall Street and so we often invited our med, her med school friends to our apartment and I got to really know about it and so while I was working actually on Wall Street uh, I decided I would go to school at night to learn all the science I had done really none of it before when I was in college at the same time you know I was working and eventually um, left Wall Street at the age of 30 and went to medical school at Columbia in, in, in New York. And I really liked medical school a lot. I, I really liked caring for people. I liked the science that went into it. I thought it was really just a fascinating thing. I felt I had really made um, the right choice. Even though economically it was a big step back at that point, I thought it was really something I could do the rest of my life. And I liked many, many things in medical school. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, it was, just the material was very interesting. Now, I was never very good at nailing, you know, two boards together straight. Um, so I knew surgery was out, but many other things did interest me. And one of the things that actually really interested me a lot does apply to today. Um, I thought psychiatry was fascinating, for, and it was for two reasons. One you get to hear great stories. You really learn about people. And as today's stories, three panels that came before me, every one of those stories is fascinating, but in a different way. That's really part of your life as a psychiatrist. And then the other part of it, and this was now 1990, um, we knew very little bit about how the brain worked. And I thought over the course of my career, we would really learn a lot more about that. So I chose to go to psychiatry, and that's actually what got me back to California. I did my residency uh, at Stanford and um, and really found again that this was something that I thought would be a very very important part of my life. Now I'd never really done any research before but at Stanford I began to do research in um, different psychiatric illnesses and sort of how they worked um, and that research actually led to intellectual property, patents, 
And so most of the time when you're at a university, as I was, when you in invent something, you have a patent, the university ends up licensing it out to a large company. Um, and I was really sort of afraid that if my intellectual property, my patents were licensed out to a big company, it might just sit on the shelf there and it might not actually ever go anywhere. And I thought it was very important. So um, again, um, I'll say this sort of as a bit of a joke, but it really was true. For my days working on Wall Street, I would actually still had five blue suits and five gray suits, and that left me in good stead to go see if I could raise some money and start my own company. And this actually speaks to, um, you know, sort of Anon, one of Anand's point, which really resonated with me, which was that, I, I still remember this, it was in the days before you actually had a uh, computer date book, so I actually had a written little date book. And I went to a vent, the venture capital firm, which eventually funded um, my new company at that point, 13 times before they wrote the first check. Uh, and the first check, you know, in, the, in, in, in terms of uh, what you think of in terms of venture capital was not for that much money, it was really for half a million dollars. Um, and, and it but it got me started. And I just sort of point that out because there really was an important story to tell. And I could do that, I could be persuasive, and it got me to the starting line. Now, the company that I started, it's called Corcept, C-O-R-C-E-P-T, really started, you know, at the very beginning with, you know, dr working on drugs, which um, I thought were for important diseases, but were really not very well studied at that point in time. And what's, what's interesting about it, um, and, and you're, you've heard from people in tech, and you're going to hear from more people in tech, is that the uh, cycle for drugs is much, much more extended. My offices right now are actually literally right next to Facebook's, you know, in, in Menlo Park. And I know because I talk to those guys, it's, you know, a generation in, in tech is sometimes 18 months. For drugs, the average length of time it takes a drug to get to market is probably 12 to 15 years. So a very, very different time frame. And in the course of um, my company, there were many ups and downs along the way. It's not a straight line. And that's another thing I think is really important, and you'll hear in other people's stories. You have to persevere. If it was easy, somebody else would have already done it. You just have to keep plowing ahead you know, if you believe in it as it's going along. And over the course of time, before my product first made it to market, I think, I think we'd raised maybe 320 or $330 million before we got one dime back in terms of any revenues. So very, very different than something really where you can turn around very quickly. Now, there's an important part of the story that, 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 that I'd like to tell you. I really love being a doctor, um, really in the ways that I described before. It's very important in my own set of values to be able to help people. So one of the deals that I actually had with my board from the very beginning was that I would actually continue to get to see patients. And so every Thursday afternoon, I go see all the patients I could never cure. They're back. They come back to me regularly. I try to take care of them. Uh, and I also teach a course and have for many, many years now actually two uh, residents at Stanford. So that's still a big part of my life. And I had a board who supported that at the beginning and has supported that all the way through. And I always thought the single hardest life choice for me was that I knew if I did the company, I wouldn't get to see patients. Uh, and if my drugs never succeeded, I would never really get those hours back. Fortunately, now it's worked out. But that is a real risk that you have to take to go forward. And it really um, says, you know, I, there, there's, there's, no, there's no benefit you can ever get for anything without a potential cost. And that was really the cost for me. Now, when my drug actually be, came to the market and it succeeded and a lot of people could use it, then it was, you know, it, it had paid off. But it wasn't necessarily going to go that way. So again, an important part of the story, I think, is that um, you know, perseverance and the fact that things can end up a little differently than where you think they were. My company now has grown um, to, I guess today, I think we're about worth about $3 billion. So in many ways, it's really been a financial success. But what really made it really all worthwhile was the fact that my core value, which was helping others, is really served well by my company. And it means that even though things are hard right now, 
um, you know, on almost a daily basis, there's a problem to solve. If you have some core understanding of why you're doing it, it makes really all worthwhile. So my, my hope for today is that, um, and, and, and I, first, I want to thank you guys late on a Friday afternoon. I'm sure you guys had busy weeks. I feel bad that we couldn't do this in person. Maybe that will be next year. I'll just tell you as a point, uh, I'm very encouraged, but um, you know, my coworkers in biosciences have done this year with the vaccine that's going to come for COVID. It's going to work, and I will literally um, get to meet you in person. But I really just want to let say, sort of say one thing to you. Life really does have twists and turns. It's very, very important to just recognize that all the foundational work that you've done, all the things that you've learned, and an attitude that you're going to be okay with adjustment I think are probably the single biggest ways to succeed, no matter what you try. So thank you. And uh, as I said, I hope to meet you in person uh, someday soon, by, certainly by next year. Thank you.